The Equality and Human Rights Commission has found that the UK has failed to address systemic racism. This ranges broadly from overrepresentation in deaths due to COVID-19, use of search powers and force by police, higher rates of poverty, uh, difficulty entering and progressing through the workforce, and poorer educational outcomes. Black and people of colour are also disproportionately impacted by the effects of climate change while being underrepresented in the earth and field sciences. This is why Octopus Energy is partnering with Climate Reframe to bring you black and people of colour field scientists and environmental scientists in order to understand how their experiences have shaped them and how in turn they have gone on to shape the world around them. Because civil rights are a movement and not a moment. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Miranda Lowe and I currently work at the Natural History Museum as a principal curator there. Um, but before I go into what, I, what my role is there, I'm going to take you right back to when I, I was a little girl. So my parents came from the Caribbean um, uh, in the 60s. My grandparents before that in the 1950s. Um, I currently live in South London, have always been a South Londoner, so that's where my um, grandparents and parents made their home. Um, we used to have like family holidays every year to the Isle of Wight as well, and I used to think that was like so far away. It isn't really, but as a kid, you do think these kind of things. And again, I was trying to um, been trying to reflect on this as well, why my parents chose that island to go to. And if you think about it, it's quite a lush island. It's relatively warmer than the mainland of the UK, and it probably reminded them again of the Caribbean. You know, they they got garlic farms there and all sorts of produce that grows on the island. And you know, my dad's from Barbados and my mum from Grenada, and so. The Isle of Wight is kind of like, that's where you get those kind of similarities um, there. So, and I think a lot of that inspired me to want to do science. Uh, I think I was inspired a lot by what was around me and what my parents um, gave me access to. And um, also, my parents are amazing when you think about it as well. They used to organise trips for black families to go to the seaside. And I just sort of think, God, they were really entrepreneurial about that because they used to sell tickets. And we used to go to uh, you know, hire coaches and we used to go to places like Blackpool. We'd always go up there when the lights um, were going to be turned on. And so all the kids would were, were, be you know, having picnics and um, down by the seaside and everything. And then in the evening, especially when we went up to Blackpool, then in the evening, you'd never do this now, but then in the evening, all the kids would stay on the coach with the coach drive. And then all the, the, the parents would then go and they would call it way back when, have a dance. So they would go and, and you know, basically <laughs> do their thing with calypso music and whatever and reggae and have a bit of a dance. And then come midnight, everybody piles back on the coach, kids are sleeping and we'd all go back that, down to London. The driver would drop everybody off. But, you know, went to Barry Island again in Wales, which I thought was miles away, you know, things like that. And you've got Gavin and Stacey sitcom when that came about. And I'm sort of thinking, oh my God, God, I remember visiting there lots as a little girl and you've got great Yarmouth and all those kind of things and so when I was um, down by the beach and the coastline I would collect um, smooth stones and draw on them with felt tip and then varnish them with, with clear nail varnish all those kind of like just starting collecting and in a way sort of thinking about it as in my job at the museum so I'm partly a curator so that's all about collecting and organising things so I was doing that way back when and my mum sort of tells me as well that when we had a cat that I used to be alongside the cat and also picking up really microscopical things and kind of putting them together so it was probably always within me to be a curator and, and a scientist in terms of collecting shells and things like that. But at school, um, there was a mural out sort of on the outside wall of the school. And so my art teacher recognised that creativity in me. And so I painted all the birds on that wall. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, one of those bullies um, kind of wrote, uh, painted something on, on that wall, which I won't repeat here, but it, it was to do with my colour. And actually, it was another, another girl who looked like me. So <laughs> when you're talking about racism, it, it, there, there is racism that, that exists within the black community and, and, and the uh, communities of people of colour. 
Um, and that wall got varnished over. Um, and I just remember trying to explain to the art teacher that that slogan on the wall needs to come off, but it, it didn't. And, you know, in the last 10 years, I've been by the school because it's in the local area and the wall has been knocked down. So that has gone for me. But the memories still remain. In London, I didn't go away like all my friends did after sixth form college. A lot of them went away in Manchester and whatever, and, and most of you might have done so yourselves. Um, so I stayed in London. Um, <clears throat> this is something that I don't really talk about that much because there was a stigma and I noticed that. So I was a, sing a young single parent as well. And um, wasn't great within the family, but I, I, I did all my exams, got my applied biology degree. And then I realized for this small, um, this uh, baby, that I had to make a living, you know. And I was actually um, doing Saturday jobs and things like that since the age of 16 in ill seasonal jobs and things like that. So I was always a bit of a, a grafter and a worker anyway, get, getting my own money. And um, so then when I had my son um, and I finished my... Um, so there was, it's really, to think about, it, it's really crazy because like no maternity leave. It was literally, had this baby, I was doing my studies, then finding a job. Um, and, but I did all that and I moved out of my parents' home when my son was 18 months old as well. I moved into a council flat. So I spent many years, uh, nearly about 17, 18 years in a council flat, um, dealing with all the issues of going into a community that again was very fractured um, at that point in time when I moved in, a lot of crime and everything else like that. Um, it wasn't easy for me, but you know, I made it through and that's what I'm trying to say. It's like, you, you can do these things if you, I mean, I just get going from one thing to another. And um, people have asked me to analyze it really deeply. I haven't really done that. It's just on the surface. I've just kept going, kept going. And because all the things, you know, I was passionate about that I wanted to do. So when I graduated, I then went um, straight into a job at St. George's Hospital in the medical school. So with my bi applied biology, it was kind of like I could have been a lab technician in a school, but I ended up in a hospital doing research on rheumatoid arthritis. And so then I moved on to work for um, the government. I won't say too much about <laughs> work for the government, um, but it wasn't in a lab. Um, I worked for the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, which has turned into the Food Standards Agency. Um, and I was in an office off Millbank, um, just down the road from the Houses of Parliament. Um, I was loosely working for Edwina Curry at the time, at the time when there was a salmonella egg scandal. So you can Google that and you will know how long ago that was. Um, but that was nothing to do with me, that scandal. Um, but uh, so I had two male senior managers and what I would do, I was a researcher, death-based researcher, um, looking into... Um, E numbers in food, legislation, draft, drafting um, speeches for particular people in parliament and government or senior managers there about food refrigeration, you name it, that's what I was doing. Again, a temporary job. And so at that point, um, I knew I wanted to do something in science and I was always reading New Scientist magazine. And then there were two jobs at the back of um, the the magazine I was reading at that point in time. And there was one that was more akin to my kind of lab kind of tech skills, um, which was the museum, Natural History Museum, was setting up um, a DNA lab, a new DNA lab. Um, and I could have gone for that job. But then I saw a job for, at the time, it was called um, an ASO. So it was Assistant Scientific Officer. So at that point in time uh, when I started at the museum, we were closely linked to the civil service, so our grades or our job titles were kind of in that same vein. So I wasn't actually called a curator at that point. Um, so I went for the Assistant Scientific Officer of Marine Invertebrates. Now, I didn't do a zoology degree. I was passionate about animals, I loved horses, photographing them and all these kind of things and sea creatures. So I, and, and it was pre-internet as well, so I couldn't do any of this background <laughs> searching and everything. So I, um, it was a lot of kind of luck, <laughs> guesswork at the interview. 
asking the question in the right way. But I just remember when I went for that job, because I just thought it was really exciting. And that's the thing. Never lose that excitement, um, that kind of an element of taking a risk in your life. I mean, they were... My, you know, there are risks and risks. But, you know, don't let anybody put you off and, and always just believe in your dreams. Right? So I could have gone for the safe thing, just doing the lab thing. But I just thought, oh, this is about animals and marine invertebrates. Let's go for it. And I did. When I went to the interview, they, they said, oh, we really love that you're like a team player because, you know, I'd, uh, as a teenager, w done a Saturday job working on the tills and stuff like that. But it's all about applying whatever you've doing, you know, your hobbies, your interests to kind of feed into whatever job, you know, um, enhancing your CV. And, um, and, and so I went through the interview and um, I didn't feel at that point in the interview that I needed to declare that I was a mum. There was, they didn't ask any questions about it. That wasn't, a, that actually wasn't a thing at that point in time at all. Um, and now it's illegal to kind of, you know, ask those kind of, kind of things. You have to be flexible around people and their families and their lives. Um, and so after the interview, they took me down in the basement of the museum. And it was a place that at the time it was called a dry storeroom number one. And it was, it was like a cabinet of curiosities. You name it, there were weird and wonderful things in there that you could never believe in your life to see. And, and they said to me after I got the job and everything else, um, that they said, when we took you down there, you were just like in awe of all what was in there. And who wouldn't be? Because you were like seeing stuffed giraffes, uh, big like molar fish from the deep that was that big. Um, like uh, there were, um, which I thought were real heads, but they weren't. There were in heads of indigenous people, but they were painted in plaster. But uh, a youngster at the time was like, God, what is this? this is real? Uh, it was just amazing. There has been a book written on it subsequently, um, and it's not arranged in the same way, unfortunately. But it was just an amazing sort of first look behind the scenes. And so I got the job, and what, I, what happened then, I was trained in-house, and that was the beauty of it. I, I sort of think, with nine grand paying at university... <laughs> <laughs> getting, getting a job in, in the Natural History Museum was a, was a better bet. I had someone working with me, a senior researcher, um, helping me dissect all these um, sea creatures called amphipods. They're really tiny, shrimpy things. I learned how to become an expert in that. For eight years, someone worked in my lab with their microscope and mine, showing me what to look for. I had all these Victorian historical collections that had been collected sort of in the 18, late 1700s, 1800s, right, 1900s, to access all the time, all the books, all the literature. I was also networking and meeting influential international scientists from all over the world that come and visit the museum. So there was nothing better training. So I was in my ASO grade, so my assistant curatorial grade, as it turned out in the end, um, for two years. That was a, considered a training grade. And then um, I was promoted to um, a, a bog standard curator. But the work that I do in the museum is basically um, a mix of cataloguing historical collections, and there's still a body of work to do, curating, kind of looking after um, uh, specimens that were collected by influential um, Europeans at the time. So I look after Charles Darwin's barnacles. And I don't often think that's really amazing until I show them to people because I sort of think, oh my God, I'm the only person in the world, and I'm a black woman as well, looking after Charles Darwin's barnacles that he studied obsessively for eight years. And his body of work, so he did four volumes of work, on barnacles actually uh, um, um, influenced his thoughts at the time on the evolution of man, human evolution, natural selection, all those kind of things. So I get to access all of that kind of stuff every day. I also um, look after um, Darwin's corals, which he did actually collect 
um, on his voyage uh, in his early 20s on the voyage called on the Beagle ship. So it's called the Beagle voyage. And um, in him collecting those corals, he formed his ideas and theories around how atolls, lagoons and um, barrier reefs are um, created as well. And so... Um, that being said, then I look after really larger collections out of that, so not just from particular people, but from, from others of coral collections that were collected, and um, in that vein that um, there are all sorts of now, you can no longer collect corals because their site is listed, so it means that it's illegal to collect them without special scientific permission and so forth, um, and we have to show due diligence if we're going to accept any um, any more collections uh, of corals into the current one that I've got. But I allow people access, and this is where all the environmental science come in. I'm, I'm an advocate, and I try to push um, that how the um, historical collections can be used, the, the data, but also the specimens themselves can be analysed to inform any kind of conservation um, you know, climate um, policy making and things like that, or to inform such as um, we have some um, corals collected from the Chagos Archipelago and um, probably about, I think it's five to ten years ago, um, it became a marine protected area, so you could, it's a no-take zone for corals there, but the historical corals that I've got from the 1970s, from three expeditions, are being used now to inform and to provide guides to identifying the living corals that are there and to assessing um, how they how they have or not been impacted by um, climate change so um, it's all that kind of work that I do as well as I do a little bit not enough of my own personal research so I get involved if there are universities that are like for instance I work a lot with Southampton University they've got their own ship and so their students go out on board ship and go and do research and do subsampling of the ocean. Over my years, I haven't um, engaged a lot with going um, at sea myself. It's usually other people that are collecting. And um, I'm unlikely to, at this point anyway, because for me, I feel there's enough stuff that there's still things that haven't been discovered that are new to science, that are sitting in pots of jars, that have never been open from the 1800s, 1930s and stuff like that. So I try to push those collections for organisations like the British Antarctic Survey to open these jars and to analyse them because that was a point in time where... Um, you know, the ocean was, was much cleaner and different things were going on. The human impact was much less. Um, it's quite interesting that um, there's one particular collector of the collections that I have called William Savile Kent. Um, he was a British guy born in Devon, but he then went collecting in uh, Western Australia. And he has collected some of the most biggest coral specimens that we have in the museum. And, and he wrote a book on a naturalist in, in, in Australia. And it's interesting, when he talks about crowbarring corals off the reef, and you sort of think, oh, my God, now <laughs> we would never do that. But if he didn't do that, we wouldn't have this coral that can prevent any more being taken, that you can analyse this big piece. That one of the big pieces was really held in, you know, was really instrumental in coral taxonomy um, that the records say in the 1880s, you know, everybody was sort of thinking, oh, we've not just got these tiny bits and we can't look at the, um, the coralites on it. So these are all these little holes that are, that are on the coral when the um, fleshy polyps have died off. And, and they use that to identify what species there are. So there's all of that that I do and then I'll just let you know um, some of the interesting things that I get to do in my job so there's science there's looking after collections there's networking meeting people but I also meet very famous people influential people so I, like members of parliament um, but also um, you know governors and and um, and people from further afield but, um, and they're in the media at the moment. One of my, I, personally, one of my lovely moments is a year ago, last February, meeting um, Harry and Meghan. Now, that evening that they came in, I wasn't 
Oh, oh, maybe, no, it was the day before. I, anyway, I wasn't supposed to be at the event. Twist of fate, I was. Um, I was asked because someone wasn't available. And um, it was um, the, the day that that letter that she's going through those issues with at the moment was released. So it was a mayhem, a madness of, of press. And they'd come in to see a theatre production, which was about um, the young Charles Darwin. I was um, presenting or showing them um, some of Darwin's corals and Darwin's octopus that he kept on board in his cabin in, in the ship when he was on the Beagle. And I was alongside um, some, um, someone who deals with special collections in our library and an entomologist, three of us there. Um, but I just thought, how amazing that me as a black woman is, is meeting Megan, who is a black woman within the royal family that evening. And I'm talking to them and showing them um, stuff to do with the collections and about Charles Darwin. And the, the weird thing also about that meeting was that we, we thought, oh, we haven't got any name badge, badges. And, the, and our press officers said, no, they just want everything informal. Because usually when we meet members of the royal family, because I've met others, I won't name drop now, but I have met others, and then it's a bit more formal. And, and they wanted really informal, and we thought, oh, my God. So we're just right, stand by. They come walking through. They get introduced to me. And then um, uh, Megan puts her hand out to shake mine. And I just remember, oh, my God, oh, my God, protocol? No protocol. Hand goes out, split second thing. And then, they, and then Harry puts his hand out. I was like, OK. Then I shake his. And it's the weirdest thing, or it was in my head, is that they're then you're engaged in a conversation and they're remembering your name, even when they're halfway down the table talking to two other people. And for me, that night, Harry and Meghan, they were really informed about things to do with climate change and nature and conservation. Harry told a few jokes. He's really funny. Um, and, and just getting a really lovely letter of acknowledgement afterwards and some lovely photos, which I still have to print out a year later for my mum, because I know she, will, she loves that kind of thing, so that, that makes her proud. But um, I think that's me. <laughs>